So tell me, why do so many people look to actors for answers? And sh <laughs> sh should I, should we be listening? I think like no more than, you, I mean, there are some people that think, you know, that basketball players should dribble and that, you know, and that actors should kind of like, you know, balance the ball on their nose and shut up, right? But um, my feeling is, is that uh, artists, you know, not necessarily actors, but artists, the actors are kind of the most visible artists, have always been kind of the social conscience of any sane society. Um, and the first thing that any sort of fascist society tries to do is to kill the intellectuals and, and, and exile the intellectuals and the artists, right? Because they're the ones that are kind of trying to reflect the truth back to society, which, which uh, is usually not favorable to the, you know, to people mm -hmm. that, uh, that want their own, their own uh, worldview to be put out there. So um, I think that everybody, is a human being and so you know you shouldn't take them any more or less seriously than any other you know human being i mean I, you can have an actor who's really bright and uh and uh really educated and has a very clear and honest point of view and you can have an actor that uh you know happens to be just as famous and have just as big a mouthpiece that says really dumb dumb ass stuff right so <laughs> Um, but overall, I think that, uh, you know, that artists are, you know, in a way, the bleeding hearts of, of yeah. societies, as, as well as, as uh, writers and directors and other artists. Um, that's what they do. They, 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 you have to go into your heart and into your creative resources and, in order to create. And, and uh, um, so I think there's, I think the idea that they should just dribble is... Uh, it completely ridiculous because yeah. they've never done that and never will no. do that. Nope. Yeah. Ah, so that, at the end of the day, right. Do your research, do your homework, yeah, know where exactly. it's coming from. And yeah. And I mean, they're out there for a reason, right? I mean, take it, take it yeah. all with a grain of salt. <laughs> exactly. Take it all with a grain of salt. I mean, some people, you know, I mean, look, there are actors out there that are, that are pounding the drum for every different position that there is. I think that the, I think it's more interesting to see where the general heartbeat is. You know what I mean? I mean, for example, uh, there are scientists out there in the world that say that there's no global warming. But that, that's, my overall, that's my the favorite. That's my favorite. Right, exactly. <laughs> but the overall consensus of scientists with, is, you know, there's the massive wave of, sci of scientific thought is that there's absolutely you know, human caused climate change, right? I mean, it's, it's not really debatable unless you, unless you're in a position to take that small position and amplify it to try to, you know, make it look the same. So I think it's the same thing with, with the artistic voice. Mm -hmm. um, there are some voices that are louder than others and they're dissenting voices, but there's one overriding voice. And that's really the one that I think is most, uh, most important to pay attention to. You know what I mean? Everybody. Uh, Grant Kramer here. If you're uh, listening to one of the podcast platforms and you want to put a face to the name, uh, you, though you might have already seen the face at some point in your life, uh, you, could, you could easily just go on Google, type in Grant Kramer with a C, and everything you need to know and see will pop up. Uh, recently, uh, some, of the, some of the bigger movies that, that he's executively produced were Lone Survivor, November Man, some of the, the most recent, and currently you're in a production of another, uh, another big one, right? Starring, starring yeah, our, the, our local, our favorite, uh, Nicholas Cage, right? Yeah, yeah, Nicholas. This is this is probably, I I would say undoubtedly. I mean, this you know, Lone Survivor was amazing because yeah. you know there was about this heroic spirit and, um, and you know, people that that, that fought so valiantly and gave their their all and brotherhood and camaraderie and you know other things. But in terms of a movie that's just pure fun movie making, I don't think I've ever been involved with a, a movie quite so much like that as this one. And you're, um, you're filming live on set. I mean, we're on set right now, technically. Right? Well, we were technically, <laughs> it's Saturday. So, so it's my rest day, right? So, um, but yes, we're, uh, we're about three quarters through the shoot. And uh, 
thankfully we're on time and on schedule and everything's going well and the footage is looking great and uh it's you know got about another week and a half to go can you explain your transition because you you used to be uh, not to say you're not as much but you used to act a lot more uh earlier earlier in the day and now you kind of went into the more story writing producing right yeah yeah i mean it really happened just you know kind of an, as an overall evolution I, I was i was acting and when i was acting i i the work that i was getting i was getting a lot of kind of uh you know the b movies and and uh, soap opera work and guest stars and things like that and i was trying to transition to have um you know more of a career that i guess you would say mm-hmm. somebody like matt damon of red pit would have you know to doing bigger works with better with 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 higher quality filmmakers, you know, just trying to elevate my career and in doing that, sometimes you, you start turning down roles and, um, to try to get better roles. And that's, that's a crapshoot, you know, in hindsight, I can see a lot of ways that I probably could have done it more intelligently. Um, how so? Well, I would have, I would have maybe held on to the job that I was doing until the, you know, and created that bridge to, to the next thing. But when you're young, you, you, you don't really appreciate how hard it is once you get somewhere that to get, you know, to get there and how difficult it is to get back up there again. So I would sometimes uh, quit a job that was, that, that I was, doing. you know, I've like, for example, when I was on the young and the restless, I left the young and the restless in order to have a feature career. And then I turned down a lot of smaller parts. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my philosophy at the time was I'd rather do one scene in a really good project than to star in, I mean, and, and I don't have okay. any embarrassment at the t- but at the time, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Even movies that, that, uh, that now I look back and are really like my, de- some of my defining movies, you know, I love killer clowns from outer space, but at the cult, time cult, it was cult classic, right? I it's mean, a cult classic, and, it's, right? and it might be, and it's coming back, right? Exactly. And you know, and we've actually been developing a sequel that we're still hoping to get off the ground. That would be really cool too. But at the time it was still kind of in a bag of smaller budget, you know, more like B movies that I had been making. And I was trying to like step up to that next level. Right. So, um, so I turned down some other movies that were kind of similar to that. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you, you're trying to get, a, you know, you're trying to get out on an interview or trying to get a meeting for something. And they say, Oh, well, he hasn't worked in a while. What's wrong with him? <laughs> Nothing's mm. wrong with me. I was just trying to, it's that missing resume piece, right? It's that missing resume piece. Exactly. So, huh. um, I mean, if I was in the same position now, I mean, they say for hindsight with foresight, we'd all be things, right? So, you know, looking back, I would have not left that job mm-hmm. until I had the job that I knew was, you know, would ha- had some legs to it to kind of bridge the gap to the next place. And um, I would have maybe taken a few of the parts that I turned mm-hmm. down. Um, and some of them just because, uh, you know, I missed out going to some great locations and just having fun in life, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, so you wouldn't have minded continuing a little more acting, right? When you had that, I guess, not to say there's not as many I, now. If you yeah. I mean, listen, you know, I, I am a believer, you know, I have I mean, kind of a, that everybody has their own karma. Right. So, yeah. so yes, if I was, if I put my head back into the space of being an actor, um, if, where I was, then, I mean, I still love to act. I mean, I, it's still, great fun when I get a chance to do it. But I had kind of burned out on the audition process, um, you know, getting in my car in LA and fighting through, you know, an hour and a half of traffic three or four times. I mean, it's a little bit easier on actors now because yeah. they, they, they put everything on tape and they don't have to necessarily do that as much. Um, you know, the advent of mm-hmm. uh, internet and digital uh, photography, you know, you can set up your iPhone and have somebody read you your lines and, and uh, you know, it saves you a lot of time. I think it's 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 a lot nicer for actors because I mean, you, just, you just get beat up going out, out for for jobs, right? And you go back and you go back, and then they pair you up with other people, and you go back again. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do believe that everything happens for a reason. And you know, if I uh, if I had continued to do that, then I have no idea. I mean, I love my life right now. I love my you know everything about it. I love what I do. I feel creatively fulfilled. I love my, you know, the family. I mean, who knows where that road might've taken me? You know what I mean? So, 
you know, you, I, you, you look back sometimes and you replay certain events and you think what you could have done differently, but that doesn't mean that you want to go back and change it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Do you, did you, did you fall into like a dark place at all? Like not getting as many roles at the time? You oh, know, of course. I, I know I that mean, there, there's, there's stories, right? Go, about go, what go, happens. All, you gotta, all you, all you have to do, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, watch once upon a time uh, in Hollywood. I mean, Leo, I just, just watched it like a week, like, two weeks ago, my fiance, Leo nails that, that feeling that I had and so uh -huh. many other actors have had that, that darkness that you're always, that you're always leaning up and playing. Really? With, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I spent more time kind of staring at the ceiling, wondering what was happening to my life. When is that next part going to come? Uh -huh. Am I really going to make it large? Am I, you know, why didn't I do that? And, you know, you do all of that. And then I think uh, what really changed, what really changed everything for me is I started teaching acting. And, uh, oh, and okay, all okay. of a sudden I was, I was, the moment that I was able to use uh -huh. this craft that I had, that I had been working on for so long, rather than just trying to continually elevate myself, but to help other people. Now I was actually using my skills. They weren't feeling like a wasted bag of tricks. Um, and I felt like I was making a difference in some other people's lives. And like all of a sudden my mojo started to come back, right? And then after a period of time of doing that, you know, I you know, kind of went back into to acting again, but I mm -hmm. said to myself, you know, I'm gonna do what, uh, what John Favreau did, you know, with swingers or what, uh, or what, um, uh, you know, Billy Bob Thornton did with, with Sling Blade. I'm going to create mm -hmm. that. I'm going to start writing. I'm going to create that part. I'm not going to just do it through auditioning yeah. and hoping somebody else gives me permission to have the career I want. I'm going to do that thing. But, yeah, exactly. Right. But along the way, when I started to write, there was a revolution that happened, right? Because most actors that are, fighting like I was in the trenches to, you know, to be, to have that great career, you know, to really, to really become great at what you do. It's an obsession. And you really feel like you're, you're, that there is no other redemption for who you are for your life other than succeeding. And you almost have to feel like that in order to drive you to get, to get to your acting class every day and to get to those auditions and to do those scenes and to keep, going after it, but it also starts to create an amazing amount of kind of darkness and despair yeah. in, in those gaps, right? And, uh, and it plays heavily on your self-esteem and all those type of things. So as soon as, as soon as I started to get out of that syndrome, right, everything started to change. And when I started to write, the revolution was, oh my God, I actually really enjoyed doing something else. Like I don't the, just have to I, do I, one this, thing. this weight came off of my shoulders uh -huh. that, that if I don't, I'm not successful at this one thing, then my entire life is going to be useless and suck. So that was the revolution. And then from there, you know, you know, I wrote a few scripts that got optioned, but the producers, you know, they have, they have, they, they have, they you know, producers option a lot of scripts, right? And they're, they're trying to develop this one and that one. And they have a disappointment or two or a couple of rejections here that they focus on the other one. Um, and then they go off to make a movie and they're gone for a year doing that and they're not focusing on yours. So, so that can be a little bit disheartening as well because, you know, the first time you're, you're, when you're a writer, a screenwriter, the first time you option a script, you think, oh my God, I've made it. <laughs> and then you realize, well, it's not, you know, <laughs> not that's that not that easy either. <laughs> um, and there's a million steps like that, right? You all of a sudden mm -hmm. get a couple of movie stars on or a big director and you think, okay, now it's all happening. But then you realize now you're just in another club of tons of movies like that that are trying to get made. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened in, in, you know, almost in the most, you know, I mean, literally I just out of frustration, I started saying, well, if that producer is not going to be calling on my script, I'm just going to pick up the phone and start calling on my own scripts, right? Not realizing that that's really the beginning of what producing producers do right is but i was doing it for myself and then uh being your own publicist being my own publicist <laughs> being my own salesman of my right. own projects right I'd, I'd already optioned the script to somebody else but they weren't working for it so i was basically doing their job for them i'd already done mine which was the writer but now i was trying to, to help them get the projects made but as i something did, about that right something about that if you're not doing it yourself yeah. um no one no one's really going to fight for you as much as you 
nobody is going to fight for you. I mean, listen, every once in a while I see people um, that have people that fight for them. That's, that's like, that's special and that's, it's wonderful. And, uh, but it's not, it's not something I think you can sell to the masses. Most of us have to just constantly be our own advocate. We have to constantly be fighting for ourselves. We have to be constantly, you know, hitting the, the ground and pulling ourselves up from our bootstraps and learning something new and developing something new and, and clearing out the, uh, you know, the disappointment. And uh, because, you know, that's, has a smell stink to it, right? You, you can't be that, that person that's, when you walk into the room to be pitching your script, you can't, you can't walk in with the, the, the last 10 meetings that you got rejected on. Yeah. You have to have cleared it all out and, and have that same kind of, you know, just effervescent enthusiasm that you did the very first time you went out there. And, you know, so you've, you've got to learn to do that. You've got to learn to keep on shedding that old skin and growing and, and, uh, and, and not stopping and evolving. Um, so what happened is I was doing that, you know, a couple other writer friends of mine mm -hmm. realized that I, you know, kind of saw what I was doing and said, Hey, well, I've got this script that I think is really great. And I just got it back and the producer didn't do anything with it. Why don't you try doing something with that? And before I knew it, I had an office and I had an assistant and, and, How uh, were you able to pay for it? Oh, like, did you uh, get some funding at first or did I, barely, I, I literally, um, I literally almost spent no money on me. Like every, almost everything I had, I spent at the time I was single and I spent, I just, I, I helps. really that helps. didn't, I almost like didn't date and you know, because that cost money yeah. and everything I had, I, I, I put towards, you know, and that's what you have to do. You, you know, where are your priorities, right? People yeah. say, hey, I really want to be successful, but I don't want to not have my nice place. I don't want to not have my nice car. I don't want to have this. You know, I was sometimes paying my assistant more than I was, than I was making. Yep. I mean, they were living better yeah. than me, right? I know all but about I had that. the upside. I, I had the upside, right? So <clears throat> you're playing, you have to be willing to play the upside. That's, so, to me, what entrepreneurialism is really all about. It's yeah. not somebody who, who comes out and, you know, inherits $300 million and then takes it and puts it on red and somehow gets lucky. It's somebody who puts it all into playing the upside. Yeah, because we sometimes we look at like acting or producing, directing that as just like a career, right? But yeah. no, there, there's a lot more to it. it. It is an entrepreneurial world, right? I mean, you are there selling yourself. You are building Constantly. something, right? Constantly. And listen, today it's very different than when I was because we didn't have social media. I mean, actors today, they need to have a presence. They need to kind of work their followers. They need mm -hmm. to... Uh, they need to uh, constantly you know, be promoting and they have all of these avenues to do it. I mean, back then, they, you know, it was, administration was really important, but it was different. It was more like literally making calls and knocking on doors and uh, you know, sending at a certain point, yeah. you know, sending faxes out. Or, right? or sending the hitman out. Right? Yeah, sending the hitman out, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Putting a you know the 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 horse's head in somebody's bed <laughs> and say if you don't give me the part, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the question we're probably all dying to hear now: Did you have your own Brad Pitt driving you around, trying to feed you drugs, kick kicking, killing the bad guys, and uh, you know getting you, you know, through the day? You know what? I, it's so funny. I, I just one of my good buddies was kind of that guy. He was a stunt guy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and he was. You know, he actually called me last week and said, "Hey, man, I'm uh, living in Florida now. You got any, you know, got any work for me?" And I actually hooked him up with our store quest on coordinator on the movie. And I, awesome. <laughs> I hadn't spoken to him in a while, but uh, yeah, he was he was you know, a, you know, he he used to train with Dennis Alexio, who was the uh, kickboxing champion of the world. He was a sparring partner. Um, you know, he had some of his issues of his own, you know what I mean? He had a little bit of a drinking problem and mm -hmm. had a tendency to like, you know, we go to a bar and, he, and if, if he'd had a few and somebody like looked over, I mean, he didn't like the look. It was all of a sudden, it was like I was pulling him out of it, right? It was like, what are you looking at? You know what I mean? It was that, it was that uh, get shorty stare, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's funny thing. I did have uh, a bu my buddy that used to travel with me on the sets and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, cool. it can be a little bit of a lonely business. I mean, look, yeah. even right now, right. I'm, I'm on the weekend and my family You're just left alone, right? and I'm making a movie and 
and I'm all alone. So you better learn to entertain yourself as well. Yeah. How, how did you get through these lonely times? Like, if you don't mind sharing. Well, I mean, when you're actually working on okay. the, on the set, it's 14 hours a day. It's a world into itself. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you show up and all of a sudden at the end of the day, you walk out and say, Whoa, there was a world out here because literally you're in an enclosed world transformed right like yeah exactly another planet but then you know listen the last week my family was here so my four and a half year old was running around my legs and wanting to wrestle with me and my wife was making me something to eat and and uh you know it was it was great it was almost it was, that's the perfect situation mm -hmm. but then they have to go home because you know he has to things to do he has preschool and jujitsu class and she teaches you know, yoga classes that she's had to find substitute teachers on, you know what I mean? It's all that kind of normal life stuff. And, and, uh, you know, you wake up and it's like, wow, here I am, you know, all alone in a strange city. But like I said, you know, you, you catch up with things, you rest, you, and hopefully over time you learn how to be a little bit healthier mentally about it all. You know what I mean? That you don't have to just kind of go out and, and, uh, that's actually my director texting me right now. You don't have to go out. You know, there's that, you don't have that as much FOMO. You know what FOMO mm -hmm. is? Oh, yeah. The fear of, of missing out. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's that, that big millennial transition, right? Into the world. Yeah. FOMO, exactly. everything. <laughs> FOMO, well, everything. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, how do you guys kind of get through those long days? Because, like, I, I don't have, I used to kind of like do some stand ins, you know, some of those like regular trying to get some money in college. And, you know, those are long days talking like 5 a.m. calls. You're there till till midnight, sometimes 1 a.m. And it's like, yeah. And then you're back the next day. Like, how do yeah, you guys you get through it? What are you guys consuming? <laughs> well, a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> Rockstar, Red Bull, coffee in the morning. Uh, beach, you know, we have a medic on set. So oh, okay. I'll go over there and I'll go over there and like, if I, if I feel like, okay, I've had too much coffee, he'll give me like a, a B12 fizz drink or a couple, mm -hmm. you know, B12 lozenges to put underneath my thing. You've, you've got to constantly be drinking kind of airborne and vitamin C or something because, you know, just to keep your immune system up. Cause uh, you know, after a while you just can imagine you, you haven't slept very much. And then you have a certain amount of adrenaline and excitement that just keeps you going. But listen, sometimes I, I like, I take a quick break and I run to do some emails and I find myself like this. <laughs> I mean, literally that yeah. moment that I stop, my, like I, my head just drops. Just and then I go, down, like, oh, I can't sit down here like this. I've got to keep going. Um, and part of what I do when I'm, when I'm producing a film, because if you've, if you've done your job preparing the film, um, most of your job on the set as a producer is kind of being there for the director, looking for things he might be missing, collaborating with him, problem solving when things come up. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to kind of, you know, be as active as I can. You know, I don't like to just be that guy just sitting in the chair watching the monitor. Um, you know, so a lot of the time I'm, you know, I'm directing second unit scenes, I'm picking up shots. Um, and, uh, you know, so you just try to stay as, as, active and engaged as you can creatively on all levels, you know? And, and I could definitely sense it and like feel it in, in your tone and your voice that you are passionate about this medium of, of film, the, the, in, in the entertainment industry, you know, what, what made you so passionate about it? Is it something, and does it have anything to do with, with your mother, you know, being in the industry before you? You know, it, part of it is probably for my mom, you know, but, uh, but, a lot of it is uh, is is kind of like uh, I was, you know, like an American version of Cinema Paradiso. I literally was that kid that I would ride my bike into Westwood, if you know where Westwood, California is, and there was all sorts of theaters and things there mm -hmm. within like a five block radius. Um, and I would go talk to the theater owners, and I would pass out flyers for them. And then they would let me in the movies to watch them for free. That's a good. And list. I would watch every single movie that came out, and uh, and you know, and I would what I would do is I would I would figure out I would go and look at the locks and I'd figure out with a you know butter knife or credit card how to open up the back door and sneak in. I mean, I literally made sure that I didn't miss any movie mm -hmm. that came out. And like I said, nowadays people do that online. They they do it from the comfort and safety of. <laughs> Of their living room, right? Not that Back we pr not that we promote watching movies for free or anything like right. that. 
but yeah. <laughs> but people that have that appetite, that's, you know, mm -hmm. they find a way to do it, but they do it online, right? They, uh, but back then you actually had to, 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 you know, you had to get there. You couldn't yeah. drive, you had to hitchhike or ride your bike. And you had to find a way to get into that movie theater. And, um, and I always just loved it. I just, I loved, you know, uh, when that lights, when those lights came off, went off and, and the movie came on and, you know, it didn't matter really almost what it was. I just, uh, I loved the experience of watching movies and I still do. You know, so I, I always tell people, they go, I, I said, I've done many things within my business, but I've never really ventured away from the business that I do. Do you feel that's what I've always what I what I've always wanted mm -hmm. to do? I noticed that when you sent the uh, that questionnaire, that the uh, things it said, you know, what was it like leaving your nine to five job? And I said, I never really had a nine to five job. Um, I've I've had lots of temporary jobs. I mm -hmm. mean, a matter of fact, I became you know almost genius of you know uh, waiting you know, one time. Well, waiting tables, parking cars, bartending, hosting. I mean, did everything you could do at a restaurant and service jobs. But then I also became really, really good at, uh, at just manufacturing work when I needed to. Mm. Uh, I mean, for example, like one time I, I was looking around my apartment and I realized <laughs> that like, oh my God, this place is really falling apart. It's looking like a shithole. So I got, got to fix it up, right? I, you know, I, ha I had the vibe of like my external environment is going to up and you know, is going to change my outlook. And so I went out and I bought a bunch of tiles and, and I, you know, tarps and, and primer and paint. And I redid my whole house, you know, over like the course of a week. And uh, I, I really had no idea what I was doing when I did that. But by the time I finished it, I was like pretty good at laying tile and pretty good at painting. A little impressed, so, huh? What? You, you, yeah, you were but, thinking you might have another career just in case. Right? Well, I'd like all of a sudden I was like, okay, uh, next month I need like $5,000 to pay my bills and stuff like that. So I literally just started calling up my friends and saying, Hey, you want me to come over there and paint your house and lay tiles? And I did like four or five of my, my friend's houses over the course of about a week and a half. <laughs> I paid my, my rent. Right. <laughs> so I would just use those skills yeah. and things, you know what I mean? And, uh, and the funny thing is, is like, you know, now I use them as, as producing. I mean, uh, you know, one time I was in between jobs and, um, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to make money. And a friend of mine said, uh, Hey, I've an actor friend of mine said, Hey, I've got this job working at, uh, targets and, and Walmarts and TJ Maxx's and, you know, you push up a little cart and you, you kind of, uh, yell free gift free gift and you give away a little like beanie baby to get people to sign up for their mm -hmm. credit card and um i i still remember putting on that i mean i'd all i i, I was a fairly you know recognizable actor already at that time right so it's like oh my god I, this is like <laughs> something public it's different than like calling your friend and going and put painting their wall that's good. right that's good I please tell me you did a, it i did it right and uh wow. and i re, i still remember like watching the people walk in after the first time I'm sitting there with the stand in the middle of the store and people are like, you know, they open the doors and the people are like walking by me. And I was like, free gift, free gift. Like my mouth wouldn't open. <laughs> but then, but then another thing yes. happened, right? As soon as I just let myself go and like, it, mm -hmm. it, liber it liberates you. Right. So that pretty soon I was like, regalo gratis, para regalo gratis. And I you was got talking into it. to people and I had a line of people around the table and I'm talking to people that are right. And once again, you know, you kind of break through those, those, those walls and ideas about yourself. I mean, I mean, 90% of it is about breaking through those like egoic bar barriers that we all have, of what who we think we are, what we have to be doing. And, and, uh, and then when people said, Hey, don't I recognize you? I was like, yeah. And I would just start talking to them about, about you know the movie or something that they liked you know when I realized that I didn't have to be embarrassed about parts that I did because I had judged them that I should have been doing something better yeah. when I started really enjoying my life is when everything started to change I mean not just in terms of what I was doing but it changes here first right here and, and here you know what I'm saying you have to you, as soon as you change your outlook on things and you change your energy everything else kind of follows suit I think. And it's something that a lot of people talk about nowadays, mindset, right? Mindset. There's like, 
Everybody's trying to coach it, show it, train it. And uh, I guess you, you mentioned, you know, up here in the head, if you're, if you're not watching the video. Um, so creativity, right? Yeah. Do you feel that your creativity That's... has been, has been kind of narrowed at all in the industry? Like has no, I know because I feel like I feel like my creativity is ten times higher than it used to be because I don't really have any any bars or limits. In other words, in other words, um, I'll be on the, the the show and and we'll need a rewrite and I'll just as a producer I'll just jump in and do it. I some, won't even sometimes ask for credit, but I can jump in and I can do the rewrite and then I'll jump in and. Somebody will go, Grant, will you play that part? And I'll jump in and play that part. And then I'll be over. The next day, I'll be directing a scene of second unit. And the next day, I'll be on the phone with another investor trying to, you know, and that to me is creativity too, because to me, that wasn't something that came naturally to me, right? I mean, learning how to, to do finance is, is, is creativity for a creative yeah. person like me. So in the course of one movie, I would have done 20 things that, are all very creative without ever stopping to think and wonder if I can, if I can't, you know what I mean? Just being able to, to throw yourself into things and, and, and be confident that you know that you can do them and uh, is uh, to me the essence of creativity. There's yeah. no like big brother overlooking the industry kind of limiting, you know, what you can say at times or, you know, are you able to fully express yourself the way you want to? Well, what? Give me a specific. Everything, everything yeah. is uh, is relative, right? Right. Yeah. Um, like, are there topics? You know, if you want to, if you wanted to produce something, make a movie. Is there? You know, do you have to somewhat conserve yourself? You know, with what you can say and how you can say it. Well, you know, only to the extent that I'm at the point where, in my life, where let's say I want to say something, but I can't, but, but I, I can't, I can't see any idea of how, if I, how doing that or saying that is going to, you know, move the ball down the road or up the hill at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the point of, I, I don't fight battles that don't have any eventual purpose to them anymore. Um, Got it. You know, sometimes uh, when I was starting out, I would find some script that I just thought, Oh, this is so, this is so, uh, um, you know, this is so revolutionary. This is so cool. This is so indie, this, right? But it would have had an audience of me and four other people. And so <laughs> of course it never get made. And I put so much time and energy into those, those battles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now I want to actually be doing it. And uh, I mean, like, listen, every, every minute that I'm, I like to spend be spending my time either on my creative endeavors or, you know, running around with my wife and kids and goofing around and playing, right? Or with my, yeah. my friends. So I don't like the wheels as, any more than I have to. So I try to be as efficient with my energy as possible. So I don't, and, and I, I, I also, you know, I'm not into other than like, other than sometimes, uh, you know, my sense of humor. <laughs> which is which can like which has a certain shock value to it which is good yeah you do <laughs> exactly that. you know what i mean it's like i'm not into offending anybody i'm into yeah. kind of creating a harmonious environment around me and and uh and i'm you know getting things done and if you could create any environment you wanted you know say right now i approach you and i'm like grant i got an unlimited budget for you we could create your masterpiece, the one you've always wanted to make. Here it is. Let's go for it. I don't care. Nothing's stopping us. What would that be? I mean, wow. You mean, but you see, you're asking like, if I had to pick like a movie that had already been made, I would have made like the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? No, no, no. This is you <laughs> like from scratch. You can make anything you want to make. Well, I'm but, already developing the projects that I want to make. So what I, if you had all the money, I would, I, it would just make things a lot easier because yeah. I wouldn't have – the hardest part about it all very often is getting other people that have money uh, to fall in love with your dream. Mm -hmm. So my dreams are already there. I mean, I've got my next five projects that I want to make. Um, they're, they're percolating. They're, the, the coffee is bubbling. Like, they're ready to go. You know, so the, the – the, uh, 
So if you're that guy with all that money that said, make all your dreams, I like my life is easy now, right? I just, I just uh, start lining them up. I figure out which one's the closest to being ready. We start to make offers. We get just the right director, just the right cast. And we kind of move on down the road. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really thinking, oh boy, I'm direct, I'm, I'm developing these projects, but I wish I was developing somebody else's projects. That's hard, I right? Love, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially, especially if you're getting paid for it and you wrote it or were a major part of it, right? Exactly. I mean, I make our friend Craig's project, you know, yes. that's a little bit more of a specialty project, right? It's, uh, you know, it's it's not as easy as calling up and saying, hey, I've got a really kitschy Nicolas Cage project that yeah, this budget. Got the book right here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. The Uninvited, right? How I crashed my, yep. my, I crashed my way into finding myself. Um, so, so that is going to be a really, really cool uh, yeah. movie. But I said, like I said, we, we, we turned it into a very meta, a very meta, you know who Charlie Kaufman is? He made uh, yeah. movies like Unbearable Lightness of Being and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, being John Malkovich and, mm -hmm. and pictures mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. it has that kind of a quality, like a very surreal, um, almost like Slaughterhouse Five kind of uh, nonlinear inside the head fight club. But it needs that special filmmaker that really falls in love with it as much as we're in love with it to get it. And then that, of course, attracts the actor to jump on board. Who knows? The act, it's such a great part for the actor because the actor's playing like multiple versions of this really wild, interesting catch me if you can character, or, you know, our oh, yeah. friend, our friend Craig. So um, it could happen that we find the actor and then that's, that's the thing that becomes the magnet that, that gives it the traction to start putting it all together. How does the right process now, go now? Like of finding the actor, like how hard is that? Um, you know, sometimes it can be like miserably hard and then sometimes you can just fall right into it. You know, I've literally gotten a call before. I've literally fought to get actors for years on projects and not been able to get them. Mm -hmm. And then had a call, had a call, and this is about directors too, from somebody I know that says, you know, so-and-so called me up and said, hey, do you know Grant? I, there's a script that I got a hold of and I love it and I want to be involved in it. And it's like, and it just kind of falls out of the sky. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a believer that if you weren't, if you weren't, if the duck, if you weren't being the duck with your, with your, paddles swimming under the surface all the time trying to make it happen that those things don't uh don't happen right but it's like once again just like the movie it's not always linear you know you, sometimes you feel like you're banging your head and you're banging your head and you're banging your head and trying to get in door number one mm -hmm. and then it just falls through door number two right but i, I think if you well, it's meant banging, to be it's meant to right, be right exactly exactly <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. And sometimes you have things that you think, how can this not happen? And uh, you just can't understand why mm -hmm. it doesn't. You yeah. know, even when, it, when, it ha when, when certain talent comes on board. You know, I've had projects that had big directors and big actors that never got made, just stagnated. And sometimes it's because you end up getting partners along the way as you're building it. And, some, and, and, each, and each person, in order to get them on board, they have a certain amount of power and certain amount of control. What if two of those people don't get along all of a sudden? Yeah. Right? And, they, and they dig their heels into the ground. Now they've gridlocked your dream, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't. Which I'm sure it happens. I mean, that's inevitable, oh, it's happened, right? We're, we're it's human. Happened more than once. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's happened many times more than once. So that's why you have to have more, you know, you have to have multiple projects Options. and you have to be able to. You have to be able to let things go quickly too. You know, I mean, you have to you have to know when to keep pushing, and when to just say, "I don't." Not to throw good good and time and energy and money after bad. You know, if something's really not working, if it's really not moving, well, you're better to you know, no matter how much time and energy and resources you've already thrown behind it, you're better to just let it go, clear the air, and put it towards something new. And I'm also a huge believer in mm -hmm. uh, clearing out toxic energy, you know, whether that's people or, or just things or habits, whatever it happens to be, like those things to me are, are, are like the anchors we drag. Sometimes you spend so much time paddling forward um, and, uh, 
really it wasn't about paddling harder. It was about, <laughs> you have to look behind you and see what you're dragging, right? Yeah. You well, pull up the anchor a great way to and, put like, it. That's and a, a little wind it. takes you, you know, a little wind can take you a long way. It's a good way but, to put it. Yeah. So, so, uh, I like that. Well, I'm no, always, that's... I'm a, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no. So I'm always trying to notice and identify and because I also have, I have a tendency, like sometimes you get an, a, a, a kind of a toxic apple in the group. And, uh, you know, my tendency is to want to see if I can make that apple better, if I can cure that apple, if I can make that apple part of the group, if I can, if I can coach and help them back into, you know, there's something swimming. about that, right? There's something yeah. about winning that, that person over. It is. And there's something right. amazingly fulfilling when you do. And, you know, but I mean, truthfully, if I look at my life, it's about mm -hmm. one out of 10 in successes. So I'm trying to be smarter of realizing and understanding uh, and being able to tell the signals. Is this person that has just fallen off the mark a little bit and just needs that little extra encouragement, you know, or are they that person that's going to just suck a whole lot of your resources, your time, your energy, your, um, and you know, whatever your money, your, you know, the, money's not even important as your time and your, your energy. Those are the most important things you have. Right. So, um, are they going to be keep sucking those things and you're not going to get anywhere? And if they are, yeah. you know, you've got to be willing to just sever it and, 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 it's, and it's let a business go too, everything. right? I mean, it's a bit, yeah. it's like you're running a business, your life, yeah. your, yourself, you're selling it. You got to make adjustments, make the right calls and, and sever everything that comes with it. I mean, it, there was, there was, there's a situation with, uh, with my writing partner and myself that, uh, we kind of had another partner that, we tried and we tried and we tried and it was just not, you know, at a certain point you realize it's there. It, it's like that book yeah. that somebody wrote about Trump, like everything they touch dies, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we, we severed every project we could from him. We let, let, let him go and any project we couldn't, we said it's yours because the faster you can, you can yeah. separate from that, from that, uh, that anchor that you're dragging, you know, and then immediately things start to move forward. We like to hang on though. Right. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just our natural kind of tendency. Oh um, dude, of course is, we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff though. It's exciting. And you know, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, hope, hoping that sooner than later that movie uh, does, does make its way onto the screen. It's going to be exciting stuff. Yeah, um, me too. Now, now we are on though to our listeners favorite segment of the show. Welcome to the round with no name because they're that? all taken. Uh, Miro is leaving the scene now. His evil twin, Miko, is here. <laughs> and he will guide you through the rest of the show. Awesome. All right. You now have five seconds to initiate and answer every single question. We just want to find out a little bit more about the real Grant Kramer. Okay. So without further ado, don't think about it too much. Just whatever your brain thinks, throw it out there. Here we go. What is your favorite book? Ty, The Prophet by Killer Gibran and Interview the Vampire by Anne Rice. It's like you were ready for this or something. What is, <laughs> what is well, your, I got to throw some curveballs at you. What is your favorite movie? Uh, not your own. No, not my own. Maybe Butch Cassidy, The Sundance Kid. Maybe... Uh, Dead Poets Society, Some classics. maybe uh, the second Mad Max movie, Road Warrior. Um, Did not see that one. The and and as a trilogy, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, something about that one, huh? Favorite actor, past or present? Or actor, actress, you know. Well, whatever. you know what? I'll tell you the actor that I would most like to work with, that I don't, that I have never worked with, Viggo Mortensen. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I got to find the right part. I got to entice him to want to do it. Um, but a lot of times, like uh, when I'm working on a script or something, mm -hmm. I will, there's some, there's a component. I don't even know what that's going to be yet. It, it, in other words, part of creativity, in my opinion, is, is, uh, which it's not, it's not uh, doing everything realistically, right? Um, like for, I, I was making a little movie once and, um, and I had this idea. It was not in the script. 
mm-hmm. but it was about shooting this this goldfish, and and uh, I was directing this little movie, right? And I, uh-huh. I and I had every character staring down in this goldfish bowl, and I shot this goldfish, you know, looking at it, and I said, I just want to see what your character would be like looking at this goldfish. And then, and I shot this goldfish sh- swimming in this bowl every which way, but, but Friday, right? And, and, uh, and I agitated the goldfish. It did not hurt the goldfish, but I agitated yeah, it. So you he, better make so sure he, you say that. Cause... And I shot him when he was calm and I shot him when he was, when he was jutting around. And we're saying, what are you doing? You're wasting our time and our resources on this goldfish. There's, there's nothing that says anything about a goldfish in your script. So yeah, so I had that asset of the goldfish, right? And when I'm in the editing room and my editor's going, you know, you got all this stuff, this whole bucket of footage of this goldfish and everybody looking at the goldfish, but I don't see it in the script. I don't know how to cut it in. And then all of a sudden we were, we were trying to figure out how to make a scene work. And I said, Grab that picture, that thing of the goldfish. Take a couple of frames out. Like when the guy's getting hit, instead of instead of cut, seeing him actually get hit, cut to the goldfish, and we're going to take some frames out, which makes him look like he's jutting, like he's getting hit. And that started the evolution. Now the poster of the movie has the uh-huh. big goldfish on it. And when you watch really? the movie, like the goldfish is analogous of like the inner lives of all the characters, right? But I didn't know why I was doing it at the time. Right? Just I, just, it? I just felt it. I saw it and I followed it. So there's something about Viggo Mortensen. First of all, I love, I mean, let me just say something. Like I'm working with Nicolas Cage right now. Um, you know, I don't know. People probably have all sorts of ideas about Nicolas Cage, good and bad and crazy because he's For done sure. so many things. Yeah. He happens to be probably the most professional He's on time, he's prepared, he's kind to everybody. I mean, he is a dream actor to work with. I mean, and that's big um, to say. You've worked with some huge, huge actors. And actresses. Huge actors. I, I've never worked with anybody who is as kind and pleasant and on time. I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of really good people, but nobody more so than, than Nicolas Cage. Um, and he's playing this crazy part in this movie we're doing right now. Uh, but you know he's friendly to everybody he's kind to everybody he never kind of goes off on his own he's always sitting there participating and you you let him when he's in character you you know you give him his space but as soon as he's ready he's just right there so everybody that i know that's worked with vegan mortensen says that he is the not just the nicest actor they've ever met but the best person they've ever met goes a long way like like a, a friend of mine that worked with him on that on that movie hidalgo uh and he's a pretty nice guy himself. He said it's freezing cold, and we're you know we're we're out in the desert, and it's it's like icy cold in the morning. And I'm in the makeup chair, and and uh, the the PA, the production assistant, opens the door and says, "Can I get anybody a coffee?" And he goes, "Yeah, I'd love one." And he says, Vigo jumps up out of his seat and says, "says Let me get you one." And he says he takes his jacket off on the way and puts it over somebody on the set. And he gets this, this PA a coffee. Like he said, he was literally, he made me be a better person by watching who he was on the set. And then, of course, I just think as an artist, he's, he's spectacular, you know, from Eastern Promises to, uh, you know, all the way back to G.I. Jane to, um, you know, recently Green Book. I mean, mm-hmm. this, you know, he really is a, 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 a Captain Fantastic, but I thought it was one of the best movies of a couple yeah. of years ago. I mean, um, or another theory is maybe he just had an eye watch on and it was telling him to stand up and get his steps and so he's like, ah, here's a perfect opportunity. Yeah, but, <laughs> but basically, but, you know, I tried to get a, a project to him once and he read it instantly and he, he said he didn't want to do it because it was a sword and sandals, mm. you know, thing. And he said, I, you know, but through his manager and, and he, he, she came back and she said, he said, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I just want to do some human movies now because I've spent the last three years like riding a horse and swinging a sword. <laughs> but she, and I said, uh, well, it's so nice of him to have read it so quickly and everything. She said, I would have left this business 20 years ago. I'm in it for one reason, because I happen to be lucky enough to manage one of the greatest human beings that, you know, I've ever met in my life. So, you know, it's created a thing that like yeah. I, I, I now I want to have that experience. I want to hey. I want to create something with them. I, I am waiting for that moment now. I, I will be in touch with you until this happens. I, I, I will. I'm, I'm keeping yeah. you to it. 
Awesome. This is gonna. This awesome. is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. So whenever I see something like that, like I, that's what I believe too. You know, you have your things that are happening right now, and you have your things that your eye is on, and you have to believe those things that your yes, eye you on because your eye is on because they, they, you know, we are. I do believe that we're that there's energy working around us, and that all those things manifest. Say you're about to be stranded on an island, which you just might be, and I'm preparing you. What is the one item you want with you? Can't be a person. And it can't, it can't be a survival item? Oh, uh, yeah. It can't be anything. Just not a person. Oh, I would say a fishing pole. <laughs> that's, that's a solid one. That's a solid one. Yeah. I mean, reel them in, right? Yeah. Man. I mean, you know, I have to, I, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be on the island, right? Yeah. And I have to be, have, I need something that's going to feed me not just today, but tomorrow. And it'd be something with but food or water. And then if, if I had food and water taken care of, it would be my guitar, which would be keep me sane. If I, uh, if I gave you $1,000 right now and you had to turn it into $2,000 by the end of today, how would you do it? Oh, uh, geez. Does somebody actually know the answer to that question? $1,000 to $2,000. What $2, would you do? I would try to find somebody who needed it so, needed a short-term loan so bad that it was worth it to them. It was worth more than two thousand dollars to them. For me to give them a thousand dollars to give me two thousand dollars today to be able to give me, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's I the mean, only reason. That's, that's the only that's, way I can think of that. Right? They must have needed that money so they bad. They must have that money to so give you the two K at the end of today. I mean, that's yeah. You it need might money be. to the second. It's worth that thousand dollars is worth ten thousand dollars yeah. to you next week. Right? Yeah, because if you're about to get your finger cut off or something by some mobster, I mean. Right. No kidding. Right. Hey, listen, do? sometimes, you know, I've been in a movie and we all of a sudden like find out, oh shit. Right. Mm -hmm. We need the money for this thing tomorrow. And we just used it for this. We weren't supposed to, but we have to have this. What are we going to do? Like that person has a lot of leverage. Yeah. You know, they can ask for almost anything they want. I mean, you hope that there's somebody handy that is not going to take full advantage of it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That it's going to say, I understand I've been in that situation too, but sometimes they're not there. And I, you know, you, we paid ridiculous things to people, you know, hundred, hundred percent vigs on, you know, userous vigs on, on quick loans just because we needed it that bad, that fast. Now to the more important questions. How do you drink your coffee? I drink it with, Cashew milk, a little honey, and a little cinnamon. Huh, that's very, very, uh, very classy. Very classy. And, uh, and I have half my friends have all gone like, what? And then I make it for them, and now they do the same thing. But when I'm on, that's like my just kind of like my comfort morning yeah. coffee. Like when I'm on the set and I just need something in my hand that's kind of like warm and then I'm sipping to keep myself awake, it's just plain black coffee. It's just black coffee. You know what I mean? Then there's like it's nothing all about else the flavor. like it. All about the flavor. Yeah. yeah. You love coffee, love coffee. I get it. Exactly. Um, and last but not least, who, who is or has been uh, the, the person you've been most, most nervous to meet? And you met a lot of people, so pick accordingly. Well, Okay. I know that I'm only supposed to have five seconds, but you got to give me, like, reference this a little bit, okay? Um, when I was younger, I met, I met a lot of people and I was really nervous. Now the people that I get, that I, it's more like excitement. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to spend a little time with, uh, um, with Martin Scorsese and, uh, you know, and he basically sat me in his chair and let me, you know, kind of learn with him for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, I thought I was going to be nervous, but he was so absolutely kind and disarming and helpful and wonderful um, that uh, I had the, when I finished, I had the feeling, I had the same feeling I did when I went the first time I went bungee jumping, right? Huh. Like I was really terrified, right? Going up, uh -huh. I had to kind of like breathe through it so that I wouldn't say something or do something stupid. But after I did it, I was on like, uh, a, a, an excitement high during and then afterwards there's an excitement high where oh, you're yeah. just, I want to do that again I want to do that again it was, it was so great and that's what it was like uh, you know with Martin Scorsese is yeah. that uh, this he, 
like what I thought was going to have, was going to be like, mm -hmm. was he was so disarming, so wonderful. And then afterwards I, I just, you know, I was flying high for weeks, you know, it's crazy how that works. Right. And yeah. if there's one person I thought like that ran through my head of people I've seen that you meet, you met, that was definitely up there in my list that I, if I was guessing. Is somebody else you're thinking? No, I mean, I, him, he was, no, he was, he was up there. I think what De Niro was one of them, right? Uh, um, you know, I have never met Robert De Niro. I know his daughter and she's pretty cool, but, uh, but Leo is, in, is one of the nicest in, in, actors that I've ever met before. Uh, Leader oh, Leo. Uh, sorry, that was the picture with you, Leo, and Martin. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, both at of them the, are... At the shot of uh, the, the pilot, right? Um, of the aviator. Aviator, yeah. Aviator. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, he's, he's a dream actor, too. Uh, I mean, such a nice, giving, kind, you know, good person as well. Yeah, really wonderful. Yeah, really okay. wonderful. That's some good company there. <laughs> yeah. But Miko is taking off. <laughs> All right, Miro is back. Hey, Miro! You, you, yes, Miro is back. Boss to boss, everybody. Boss to boss. Uh, Grant Kramer, thanks so much for being on the show. Really appreciate uh, everything, everything you shared with us. Uh, you, did, you really went deep, and uh, these are a lot of things that I know a lot of people are curious about. So you know, be sure to uh, check him out, Grant Kramer. You can do it with a C. You can just yeah. type it in on Google. Um, he'll pop up right away. Uh, some some of the past movies, Lone Survivor, November November Man, some kind of beautiful. I mean, there's a lot more in the works, uh, and there's there's so many. I mean, you've you've been involved in what like fifty some movies, maybe even more. A lot. Like sometimes <laughs> I uh, I Crazy. I looked at my IMDb profile, yeah. and going like, oh my god, right? <laughs> there's a lot of movies. So it's That's fun. a lot of movies. Yeah, acting, producing. Hopefully um, a lot more it. because I, yeah. I, I, I'm more excited now than I ever am. I mean, I'm making, and I'm having my most fun experience ever right now. Yeah. Oh, awesome. by the way, uh, the movie I'm making now, can I say, say something about it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, 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 it's an, just an amazingly fun off the wall movie. It's uh, the pitch of it is, is it's killer clowns meet, uh, meets uh, I mean, pale rider meets killer clowns from outer space. It's Nicolas Cage Sounds battling wild. Chuck E. Cheese animatronics, um, possessed Chuck E. Cheese animatronics. A completely whacked, you know, just fun, uh, cinematic, wonderful, wonderful movie. Um, the co-star of the movie is the girl on Party of Five. She's like wonderful. Her name is Emily Tosta. The director is Kevin Lewis, who's like one of the most passionate directors I've ever worked mm -hmm. with before. It was brought to be by a, a, an actor friend of mine who's become kind of a protege of mine. who's just a wonderful guy named Jeremy Davis, who, who's the one who found the script. And, uh, and it's going to come out probably around Halloween this year. And um, I think Perfect. it's just going to be like just pure cinematic, you know, wonderful fun. Do you, uh, is the title known for sure yet or is it still up in the air? Because I know well, you said right it's working, now, right? If, if anybody, if right now, if anybody looks it up, they'll see what it's called Wally's Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, we've already internally changed the Wally's Wonderland, which is a kids' entertainment center in the movie, to Willie's Wonderland. So the title is probably going to be Willie's Wonderland, just changing the one letter. Mm -hmm. But there's a small chance that our distributor, you know, might want to just find something that has let that just be the title of the of the the venue in the movie and change the name entirely, but 99.9% .9 of the chance it's going to be Willie's Wonderland. Um, awesome. Well, everybody, but, Willie's Wonderland. That's going to be, uh, yeah. it's going to be, that sounds super uh, wild and different and perfect time of the year for it to release. Right. It, it hopefully totally. it makes it by that time. Totally. Yeah. Hopefully it's going to be the first of kind of launching a little uh, new Nick Cage franchise. Very cool movie. Yeah. We could always use one. Right. I mean, I feel yeah. like it's, it's been a minute. Um, yeah, since, Absolutely. Uh, so awesome. Grant Kramer, thanks so much for being on. I look forward to what's to yeah. come and we'll definitely be in touch. So till, uh, till next time, we'll catch up. We'll do a follow-up awesome. at some point, 100%. I'd love to, man. Thank you, Miro. Thank you. That is all for this episode of Boss to Boss. Your next step is to visit boss2boss.com where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is Bossed, the number two boss.com. And remember, 
The time is now. 